question and can I say thank you very much to everybody who's come here to listen to me today. OK, so firstly, a bit about my own research. Um, I've done a lot of things, as you heard from Nigel, but the biggest probably contribution in my research has really been around the technology enhanced learning space. Um, and I started sort of quite a big project with some colleagues about 10 years ago, um, really in the area of immersive learning and immersive training environments. Um, and what I've done has been sort of developed through four very large uh, European funded projects. But it really all started with a problem around the training of uh, crisis managers. So when we're talking about crisis managers, we're talking about the people who need to deal with some of those big problems, like when 9-11 occurs, that type of thing. So when a crisis occurs, you don't just run down the hill. Actually, you have to get people around a table to try and problem solve. And those people around the table are often coming from different agencies. So you may have your chief of police, your chief of fire, your local mayor, your health sector. So all the people that need to come together to try and solve that particular crisis. And one of the problems with having all these different agencies trying to work together is they often have different cultures, different priorities. Um, and seriously, when you're looking at perhaps life and death scenarios, they may have different views about if somebody has to die, which set of people are going to die. It's quite a challenging situation, and it's also extremely stressful. So training does occur for these people. Certainly in the UK, it's quite regular that the senior people, often called gold commanders, will come together regularly in a group to, uh, to experience some training. And what often happens, there's, there's, there's two typical strategies. The first one is that people sit around a table, they get given a scenario by a trainer, and they try to have to imagine that particular scenario. They may get shown the odd media piece. Um, but it's not very emotionally engaging, it's not immersive, and it's often quite a relaxed approach. The second approach is actually uh, simulating a, a, a crisis situation uh, for real. So actually setting it up, actually having what looks like a plane crash, having people running around buildings and, and stuff like that. The difficulty with that is it's, it's quite expensive. You can only really simulate a very small part of a scenario and you've got fairly sort of limited outcomes that can occur. So we set about trying to come up with something that was a bit of a middle ground on that. But the, the key problem in a, a crisis scenario is making decisions under stress is different to making decisions when you're not stressed. So one of the key factors we were required to build into the software that we were developing was about how we can actually put people under stress to see actually how they make different decisions. So we developed a uh, scenario-based learning tool. And what that did was it would actually present people with a problem. And then different events would occur as the scenario unfolded, and people required to make decisions, and the scenario would adapt and change depending on the decisions that they made. So that being a dynamically changing scenario was a crucial factor in the training that we were developing. So the solution we looked at had to be immersive, it had to be emotionally engaging, it had to allow a trainer to actually manage the stress of those individuals because we had to put people under stress. So if a trainer thought, that people were perhaps not um, really in, uh, looking as stressed enough. They could perhaps lob in a new event into the scenario on the fly to see if they could trigger uh, somebody's stress. And this could actually be done as an, a, an individual approach or it could be done as group training. Um, again, one of the key challenges for crisis management training is that people are busy people. They may well be out there dealing with a crisis and so some of them may not make it to the training. What often then happens is that the trainer would have to try and role play a particular role within a scenario that might be crucial. You know, if the chief of police wasn't there, but you needed that scenario to have input from the chief of police. Not only would they have to then actually manage the training session, but they might have to themselves role play the chief of police in that. So again, one of the criteria was that the computer could pick up and try to role play some of that, uh, um, some of those uh, particular roles if somebody was missing. So you could set up the system to say this one's played by a human, this one's played by a computer. But the key is about it had to be adaptive, it had to be able to change during the scenario execution and really provide a very personalised experience either for the group or for the actual individual. 
But just going back to the stress monitoring again, one of the other things we did was allow inputs from uh, various biometrics. So, for example, we could uh, take on board people's heart rates. And initially, it was quite interesting. The trainers thought, uh, well, I'm not sure we need the biometric inputs. Um, but once they saw that data, they were absolutely fascinated by it because they were looking at people who outwardly appeared to be extremely calm. And some of them were indeed calm, almost clinically dead, they were so calm. But um, others, their heart rate was, uh, was through the roof. So, of course, that did require that we manage the stress we put people under. And uh, during our initial trials, we had to have a doctor present in case we shot somebody's stress levels through the roof. Anyway, so it all started with crisis management. But actually, the system is an empty system into which you can upload any scenario. So it's, it will just play through different events in the scenario, adapt as... Uh, people choose different routes through them and make different decisions. So you could, for example, train somebody on the stock market and upload a scenario that says, you know, this has gone up, this has gone down, what would you buy? I know it's all done by computer now, but you get the picture. So it's really quite an open generic system and it's been used in a number of ways. It's, it's currently training uh, firefighters in Corsica and uh, Melbourne. So that's what it looks like. So when I say it's immersive, I know a lot of you will instantly think virtual reality. We did start off with a virtual reality interface, but um, the short answer is the demographic of the people we were training at the time was not such that they were really going to get engaged in, in the virtual reality immersive uh, world. So we went for something that was um, slightly more uh, pragmatic, but essentially what happens is you've got the events that occur in a scenario down the side, and then you've got uh, different media pieces, documents you might be sent for real, text messages, whatever might happen in the real world being sent to you and displayed on the right-hand screen. And this is just an example from a, a child abduction training scenario that we, uh, we did for training the police in various countries across Europe on, on one of our other European projects. OK, so that's all I'm going to say about my own research. So immersive training, technology, intelligence is kind of my background. But as I said earlier, my real interest is where all this is going um, in the future. So the first thing I want to talk about, just to be clear, is really what the different definitions of artificial intelligence are. And there are many categorizations. This is just one of them. But uh, what we have at the moment is really what is in the category of narrow AI. This is artificial intelligence that is very good at doing a small, single task. Um, and the example there is playing chess. So it was 1996 when we first had uh, Gary Kasparov, the world champion, who was actually beaten for the very first time by a computer. And as you can see that little graphic on the right-hand side, the computers continue to go like that, and, and, and humans are still kind of at that level. The next level of artificial intelligence is really the general one which is considered to be at the level of human intelligence. We are absolutely nowhere near there at the moment. Um, we can simulate it in some cases. But the final one is what's called super AI, which is really where artificial intelligence becomes more intelligent than humans and can outperform them. And there's been a number of predictions and, uh, around that. And, um, I'm sure many of you will recall what Stephen Hawkins has said. So he initially said that essentially um, us slow to evolve uh, human beings aren't going to be able to keep up with artificial intelligence and it will just evolve and essentially take over and the human race has got about 1,000 years to live. Um, he then revised that to about 100 years to live. I hope to be a little more positive than that, but it's not re unrealistic in my head, the scenarios that, 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 that are being described. Um, and as you see there, Elon Musk famously said, we are summoning the demon with AI. So with any technology, there are always pros and cons. And that's what I hope to talk to you about for the, uh, for the rest of this uh, session. OK, so let's look at a bit of the impact of technology and the fourth industrial revolution on society at the moment. We have had businesses in the world that have survived for many, many years on the same business model. But technology is now causing a disruption. Business models are having to change to compete. You only have to keep hearing on the news every day about what's happening in retail, how stores are struggling, because people are now doing a lot more shopping online, and the high street is struggling to survive. So 
Technology is essentially destroying silos. You don't only have more business to business, you have more customer to customer. And so business are having to use technology to reinvent invent themselves and find a new competitive edge. And so just to give you an example of that, in 2000, Goldman Sachs employed 600 equity traders. By 2017, there were just two supported by 200 engineers. And you can see that's the before and after for the space that was used. Um, it is no longer busy, full of equity traders. But I, I, I like the quote best from Hamish McRae from The Independent, who said in 2015, really, that you know something different is happening in the world when the world's largest taxi firm, Uber, owns no cars. The world's most popular media company, Facebook, creates no content. The world's most valuable retailer, Alibaba, carries no stock. And the world's largest accommodation provider, Airbnb, owns no property. It's quite fascinating to see how business is changing. So what are the industries that are ripe for automation? When you look at this, everybody mentions healthcare, automotive, the self-driving cars, smart homes, manufacturing, comms, retail, energy, transport. Not many people mention education. Education does crop up, but it's generally not the first thing that people think about as being automated. Obviously, uh, automation and, and, and artificial intelligence has the potential to transform lives, make us much more efficient, and obviously enhance service levels and a lot of other things. But it's interesting that education isn't one that people tend to talk about, because largely it's actually been un, unchanged. Although it'd be interesting to hear from Derek Muller about the history of how technology has supposedly going to be revolutionising education. This will revolutionize education. No prediction has been made as often or as incorrectly as that one. In 1922, it was Thomas Edison who declared that the motion picture is destined to revolutionize our educational system, and that in a few years it will supplant largely, if not entirely, the use of textbooks. Yeah, and you know how that worked out? By the 1930s, it was radio. The idea was you could beam experts directly into classrooms, improving the quality of education for more students at lower cost. And that would mean you require fewer skilled teachers, a theme common to all of the proposed education revolutions, like that of educational television in the 1950s and 60s. Studies were conducted to determine whether students preferred watching a lecture live or sitting in an adjacent room where the same lecture was broadcast via closed circuit TV. What would you prefer? In the 80s, there was no debating. Computers were the revolutionary solution to our educational woes. They were audiovisual, interactive, and could be programmed to do almost anything you like. Well, at the time, they could run Oregon Trail, but their potential was obvious. Researchers suspected that if they could teach kids to program, say, how to move a turtle around a screen, then their procedural reasoning skills would also improve. So how did it go? Well, the students got better at programming the turtle, but their reasoning skills were unaffected. Even by the 1990s, we had not learned from the failure of our past predictions. And I quote, The use of video discs in classroom instruction is increasing every year, and promises to revolutionize what will happen in the classroom of tomorrow. Video discs? Yeah, those giant oversized CD things. Remember when they revolutionized education? Nowadays, plenty of things are poised to revolutionize education, like smart boards, smartphones, tablets, and MOOCs. Those are massive, open, online courses. And some believe we're getting close to a universal teaching machine, a computer so quick and well-programmed that it's basically like having your own personal tutor in a machine. A student could work through well-structured lessons at their own pace, receiving immediate and personally tailored feedback, and all without the interference of a meddlesome and expensive teacher. Do these claims sound familiar? Over the past 100 years, a lot of areas of life have been revolutionized, but education is not one of them. By and large, students are still taught in groups by a single teacher, and that is not what a revolution looks like. Okay, so the question is, are things poised to change, or are we still going to continue in the same way? So one of the questions is, why should we change? Some might argue that actually the staple approach that we've had for a long, long time of us standing here, you know, imparting our words of wisdom, well, it's worked fine before, so 
Why should we change? Um, well, I'm sure many of you know the research that says, actually, if you stand here and try and, uh, you know, feed lots of information to people in, in, say, the space of an hour, the traditional lecture, pretty much what I'm doing at the moment, um, the concentration will tend to wane after about 20 minutes. Um, uh, it can even be just four or five minutes, depending on the state of the student and whether they're really ready for that piece of learning at the time. Uh, so the other research says that actually people, even if they are enthused and, can't, and, 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 and really want to listen to what someone's saying, your brain does not concentrate that well for that long. All sorts of thoughts fire into it. So I'd be interested in how many of you at the moment have actually hung on my every word or have you thought, oh, I must, must think of what, what, what must I do for the shopping on the way home? Thoughts come in and you miss things that people say. You can spend up to about 33% of your time in irrelevant thought in a lecture. So it's not necessarily uh, the, the, the best mechanism. The other challenge that I think that uh, is, is with the lecture is, of course, that it's a one-size-fits-all. There's been studies that say that, of course, if you're going to really enjoy your learning and you're going to actually really be able to learn and you're in an appropriate learning environment, then you really need to be learning at the edge of what you already know. So I'm sure if I was standing here putting up equations on quantum mechanics, which I don't understand myself, most of you probably switch off. It's not necessarily your field of expertise. It's not at the edge of what you know, so you can't follow what's going on. Similarly, if you know quantum mechanics inside out, you're gonna be completely bored. So you need to pitch the learning at where people are at the edge of their knowledge and they can actually get pleasure from that new knowledge and they can understand it. We also have issues around our traditional assessment. So um, it's, it's not uncommon for students to cram for an exam. I've certainly done that in my life. If only I could remember everything I crammed for an exam, I would love it. Boy, I've lost most of what I've crammed for an exam. So, you know, the research tells you that actually it's a lot better if you can do spaced repetition. If when you're about to forget something you've learnt, actually you get nudged to learn it again, you're more likely to retain it over a period of time. So I would say perhaps what we're doing isn't necessarily the best approach. But the one, uh, the, the one piece of research that I did quite like, a, a bit of fun, was uh, Ros Picard from MRT. She wired up <clears throat> all her students for a week. She put some uh, skin conductance on them to find out uh, uh, what, what you get from that is your psychological or physiological arousal. It basically sort of is how, how sort of awake you are. And frequently accompanies co uh, cognitive performance. It isn't directly a measure of brain activity, but there's a broad correlation. So um, you can see here from one of her students that here is the brain activity in class and here's the brain activity in sleep. So there were actually more, less brain activity when they were listening to a lecture, which was fascinating. It's a bit of a broad statement, but you get the picture about whether the lecture really is uh, the best mode. And of course, given you're all about to switch off after 20 minutes, I've probably almost lost most of you in the room at this point in time. So how might technology and AI disrupt education? Well, there's a variety of places and spaces that it can do that. So the first one that is starting to grow is the concept of the smart campus. This is really about having sensors uh, all around the campus, often referred to as the Internet of Things. So pieces of equipment can tell you when they're going to die or when they need repairing or order replacements for themselves if uh, some part of theirs goes wrong. But it's looking really at the sort of the campus navigation, what we can wire up, how we control the heating, how we can perhaps measure our CO2 emissions, energy monitoring, movement, etc. Often what happens though is when that, that, that is, happens in a campus is that you get siloed data sets. And where you get the real advantage is when you bring those together to the intelligent campus where you aggregate and analyze that data to really provide a, 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 an appropriate experience for staff and students and more information for staff and students. So not just about the environment, but library access. It, it, it could even alert you if the cafeteria is getting low on your favorite lunch. All sorts of environmental factors. And I think that's a direction of travel that should make things more efficient for um, for, for campuses who can, act, who can actually afford to do this, it's got a huge number of benefits. But there's also AI in teaching and assessment. So quote here, if only I had a few, few more papers to grade, said no teacher ever. 
I pause in case anybody wishes to dispute that. I'm sure there are many managers in the room who could assist you if you would like some more papers to grade. Anyone? I didn't think so. OK. So AI can actually try and help in this, and it is in some places. So AI has supported staff in the automatic marking of tests, giving feedback on essays, and generally also predicting student performance, gathering lots of information, not just about the teaching performance, but also about their involvement and engagement in the campus, the library, and everything else. It can assist with team formation, trying to get appropriate mix of skills, um, online proctoring of exams. So it can do the analysis of images and sound if you've got somebody taking a remote exam that may then alert a human being to suspicious behavior. Because if you had several thousand students taking a remote exam, uh, you can't have enough people at the other end to simply watch what people are doing. So AI can certainly help with that. Um, it can also help support for drafting essays, so it can put students in their, in their education. And really where we're heading, or we're supposed to be heading, is that personalised learning assistant for a student. Um, although one of the questions I would have around this, and it was interesting, there's an article in the Times higher today, is really about plagiarism. We already allow proofreading of assignments, but the question is, when do we start to say, actually, this isn't your own work? And do we need to think about the type of assessments that we set that aren't perhaps prone to the traditional uh, 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 aspects of plagiarism at the moment? So I, I'd be fascinated to see when the first cases that we have when we accuse a student of plagiarising a robot as opposed to another human being and quite how we will deal with that. Of course, if we can get hold of the robot, the robot should hopefully tell us exactly what it did, so we should have the evidence there. But it's certainly a direction of travel, and I think something educators need to think about in terms of how we actually set assessments and how genuinely we can support the learning process. And I think that our, our approaches to assessment and what we assess are going to be quite different going forward. But it's also used and actual tutoring. Um, so this is one of my favourite examples, and some of the colleagues will know because I've told them about it before. But uh, just looking at the classic example of the AI tutor at Georgia Tech, I think they first started this in about 2016. What they realised was that students would typically ask questions in the same way. Sorry, the same question, but in a different way. And it didn't matter how many thousands of students that you might have on a particular course, Actually, the vast majority of questions they could categorise into a certain set of groups. So the first time they ran this, and they called, um, they called the tutor Jill Watson. It was based on an IBM Watson machine, so I assume is where they got the surname from. And, and she, I don't know really whether to call an artificial intelligence she because it's Jill or whether it's an it, but I'll go for she. She was one of nine teaching assistants um, in an online grad course. They said... Uh, at Georgia Tech. She performed admirably, perhaps a little too promptly, yet nobody suspected she wasn't human. That was the first run. They've done it ever since uh, with all their runs of this particular course. Um, and to give you another example, so obviously the cat was out of the bag once this became public, so students taking the course might realise that one of the tutors was an artificial intelligence. So one of the runs they had 15 tutors, 13 were human and two were an AI. They actually told the students up front, two of them are artificial. They gave them all pseudonyms, so all the teachers didn't use their own names. After five months, they asked the students to vote on uh, who was a robot and who was a human. So 10% of the students did not get a single one right. 10% got one robot right, and 50% got another. And uh, when I told my principal, Nigel, this recently, he then asked, so did the staff need counselling, having been told they were a robot? And the answer is, I have no idea, but it's certainly something we're going to have to think about in future when that, that blurring occurs between what uh, AI can achieve and what uh, students can achieve. But, of course, this is an example of AI performing in a very narrow area and performing well in a narrow area. And initially, they had to check the um, outputs of the AI, so they did a mirror site, and a human vetted what, the, uh, what Jill Watson came back with before releasing it to the students. Um, 
So when a student decided to ask Jill out on a date, had absolutely no idea how to respond because that wasn't within his remit. Um, and indeed, one of, the, one of the tutors wanted to, to nominate one of the AIs for a, teach, a teaching assistant award. They thought the person was that good, or the AI was that good. So there's a lot of issues around that, but this is something that I think is coming at a certain level. It's possible to actually do really good and really excellent tutoring in that narrow AI um, task. They also, on one of the runs, used what they called were nanotutors. So they had 125 nanotutors. My understanding is that each one was associated with an exercise they asked students to do. And so the nanotutor would try and encourage the students essentially to get to the best answer through a series of stages. So it would look at what the student was doing and try and get something that they may categorise in all possible answers, you know, into a valid answer and then encourage them into what would be a correct answer and then encourage them towards the best answer. And you have to say, well, how, how might we use this in future? And certainly thinking about the fact that half the world's population does not have access to good education. If there isn't a human there, you have to say, well, is an AI actually better than having no human at all? Um, obviously, if it's accurate, it might be, but who knows? We have to think about that. And I also think, where is this going to go in, in, internally? So I think about what happens at Abate and other universities and other education sectors. Uh, what will motivate universities to change? So will competition drive progress? I think, in, certainly in the university sector, we do tend to look very much to each other. What is everybody else doing? So, you know, the trend is everybody's got a virtual learning environment. Now everybody's looking at lecture capture or content capture, as maybe we're supposed to say. So when more AI starts coming, I think competition will actually make us think, is this the right direction to go? Is this perhaps where we need to be? Oh, just say I forgot to, to clarify uh, at the, the top there, it says the Turing test. The Turing test is actually uh, something that was invented by Alan Turing in 1950. And it's really the test of a machine's uh, ability to exhibit intelligent behaviour. And it's really about, can you distinguish a computer from a human? And there's been lots of claims around the Turing test. And, and what happens in my sector, and I'm sure the, uh, the other professors who are on the same mailing list as I am in computer science, say, so whenever everybody stands up and claims they've, they've met the Turing test, there's a lot of discussion behind the scenes. Well, the fact is it's not real intelligence. It's actually mimicking intelligence. And the question is what we really expect that to happen. But officially, I think the, the Turing test has been met, but not through true, true intelligence, through just simulated intelligence. OK, so one of the things that's happening in um, education is AI chatbots. These are kind of your digital personal friends that are going to help students and staff, they are not just for students, although students tend to be the trend. Um, so I sort of just showed this little video. This is from uh, Deakin University in Australia, but I'm very aware that in the UK there are at least four higher education institutions who have one of these already, and I know there are a lot more developing them. And again, that's something that we are looking at here at Abate. Anyway, just to give you an idea what an AI chatbot might do in education, I'll just show you this little video. Gini inverts the equation from supply to demand, meeting the students where they are in their own lives, and engaging with them in a way that is intuitive and inspiring. So we've worked really hard to broach that gap between the human and, and the digital, so that every interaction with Genie feels as natural, as comfortable, as authentic as possible. Our designers and our developers have worked really hard to ensure that Genie doesn't just deliver the right information or action the right tasks, but hits the right note in every conversation and interaction. Design Genie to be useful, functional, efficient, effective, you know, all of those attributes that you would expect of an assistant. But our ambition is much greater than that. Our aim is for Genie to be capable of being a, a companion in, in digital form, a friend, if you like, that's always with you, always there for you.
So Genie uses a very familiar chat interface and it understands natural language. So all you need to do is push a button and ask Genie exactly what you want. Hey Genie, where do I even start? Hi Tujon, would it help if we break down your current assignment? Because Jeannie converses with you, it has to have the right tone of voice in a whole range of given contexts. OK, here's how it looks between now and the due date. Shall we put these dates in your calendar? OK, so now's a good time to start with step one. So Jeannie has a fully and very carefully curated personality of its own. How do I reference an image? One of the beauties about Genie is the simple administration tool that we've built. And this makes it really easy to build new conversations for all of our students. You don't need to be a programmer to build things on Genie, you just need to use the simple drag and drop interface. So Genie is for all of our students. And it's there to provide a supportive personal experience for their learning. But for Deakin, it's there so that we can provide it at a massive scale. OK, so you can watch that. There's a lot more to that if you want to find the video online. But I think the key point that uh, I really want to make here is that a one size doesn't fit all anymore, not just looking at lecturing, but looking at the way forward. Personalised learning is possible to be here now, and that's something that we need to look at. But there are some challenges. We are starting to gather an awful lot of data on our students, not only where they are, their location, how they learn, and of course, that brings with it ethical and privacy issues, which I'll talk about a, more, a bit later. But there are huge uh, factors that we need to think about. But I think education is set for a revolution, or maybe not a revolution, a very big evolution, or an evolutionary jump. Um, we do have to think about our staff here and, and our students. This whole thing can be quite a culture shock. We always assume that because uh, students are embedded and immersed in technology. That means that they're all uh, up to speed and very happy to use it. That isn't always the case. So these are the stages of workplace culture shock that we may be going through at Abate at some point. So there is a honeymoon period. I'll start in the honeymoon period now. Um, obviously, technology can cause a huge amount of anxiety. Even for me as a professor of computer science, that doesn't mean I know everything. That doesn't mean I'm, I'm competent at every application that appears. Uh, I can certainly also have anxiety about that technology. But then there generally becomes a period of adjustment and acceptance when things just become normal. But So what I really want to do now is just have a little navel gaze at educational models of the future. And this is something I'm going to have to ask you to bear with me because you might think I've gone a little mad. So, first of all, I want to talk a little bit about human organ augmentation, or actually, I guess, cyborgs. We are very good at the moment in actually engaging technology with our bodies in all sorts of ways, but primarily surface of our bodies, not inside. So, we have skin resistance, we have EEG caps, we have fitness trackers, I'm sure many of you have one. Uh, we recognise palms, fingerprints. Uh, Google, which I think has gone away for a bit, but I'm sure it'll come back. The contact lens that, you know, you have, have stuff in there you can see. But um, Elon Musk said, and I have to say that I agree with him, that over time, I think we're going to see a closer merger of biological intelligence and digital intelligence. And one of the areas that I confess I don't know much about, and I'd be interested if anyone in the audience does, is that of biohacking. People are often called, I understand another term is grinders. But people are experimenting with putting technology in their body, not just on the surface of their body. So that top picture, there was a trend many years ago to experience the sensation of magnetism. And so people opened up their little, the third finger was traditionally the one they did, opened it up, put a magnet in so they could experience the concept of magnetism. A second picture, which I find actually rather horrific, is somebody who's put a temperature sensor in their arm and is reading it off their, their tablet. Um, the bottom one is someone who's experimenting with what bioluminescence looks like in their skin. I don't think it has any purpose. They might find one. But there are a lot of people who are actually prepared to uh, experiment with hacking their bodies with technology. And so we have to see where that might go in future. One of the questions... And, and again, this is where you may think that I've gone slightly mad, is um, whether you can actually ever do direct brain input. 
So I'm just going to show you a little clip as to what I'm thinking about. I'm sure some of you may recognize this. It's a little clip from the Matrix movie. So the point that we are at is there's two key characters in the movie called Neo and Trinity. And they need to go and fight the bad guys, as one traditionally has to do in a movie. Uh, and basically, they've got a helicopter, but they don't know how to fly it. Can you fly that thing? Not yet. Operator. Tank, I need a pilot program for a B-212 helicopter. Hurry. Let's go. Okay, it's a lot more exciting to watch The Matrix than me. But the point is, are they completely science fiction, uh, the knowledge to download, uh, sorry, to actually fly that helicopter was downloaded into the brain of Trinity and then they were off to fight the bad guys. So is that possible or is it complete work of science fiction? Well, the answer is it may be. It certainly isn't yet, but people are working on it. So here's some examples of people, obviously not quite as swiftly as through a phone to your brain, um, as you can see, people are wired up quite horrendously, but actually starting to say, how can we get thought ways from one person to another? So this is an example where people have actually start to think about trying to move a mouse in a particular game. And last I knew, they got as far as somebody's hand twitching in that direction um, over the internet. Okay, so there's some researchers working on it, but there's actually some serious uh, uh, money being invested in this. So. I'm sure you've already heard of DARPA, the Defence Advanced Research Projects Agency. Um, they have a programme around targeted neuroplasticity. And what they're trying to do is to essentially reset, work out how to reset the brain to how you are more when you're childhood, because your brain is more plastic and able to learn, um, and with, uh, which, is completely, which is important in being able to rewire connections for the process of learning. But most importantly, which I highlighted in red there, one of their focuses is about downloading new skill sets. Obviously, it's completely early days. We can't do it. I don't know if they will ever do it. Um, I have no idea if they'll do it in my lifetime or some of the students' lifetime. So uh, it's something to, to, to watch. It's not necessarily complete science fiction. But if we did get there, what might the consequences be? Great minds think alike, unfortunately, so do stupid ones. If you actually downloaded learning into your brain, uh, would we all start to think alike? And then what if that learning was hacked? It could be quite a terrifying experience. But if we ever did get to this point, because there are other experiments other than DARPA, there are experiments where people have tried to uh, take the brain waves of experienced pilots and put them into novice pilots and had significant uh, enhanced performance. But how might that pan out for job opportunities in future if some people are prepared to hack their bodies, take the downloaded learning, um, and indeed take drugs. I, I, ha I don't even go into that, but we, uh, I hate to say this, but we all know that there are students today who will take performance enhancing drugs to help them perform an exam. So there, will we end up with a tiered society for those that will do it and those um, that, that won't? That is indeed if we actually have jobs left in the future, so I'll talk about that later. There is some controversy as to how much uh, or how many jobs could actually be automated. Okay, so towards the final part of my session, I'd like to talk about the ethical, moral, privacy and security issues. This is a minefield, so I can only really give you a short taster here. Um, but I think one of the questions we probably need to ask ourselves is how far should AI replace humans if indeed we actually have any control over that? Um, we don't really have a, a moral compass for AI. We don't really have an agreed judgment about what is right and what is wrong. Uh, lots of people have different beliefs, uh, your, your culture, your values, your country, religion. They'll all have different views about what they think is right and wrong. But every time we program an AI, we're actually making those decisions. Somebody is making those decisions. So. At the moment, my biggest fear is actually we're in the hands of the technology developers. People tend to just embrace new technology. New app is exciting, it does something, but often we do not question what's behind that. 
what, it, what, what is it teaching us? What is it telling us? What is it doing with our data? And there's been lots and lots of issues, I think, you know, raised as you've seen. But an interesting one, and I'm sure you all know the case in 2015, that uh, Volkswagen intentionally, intentionally programmed diesel engines to activate, uh, 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 to activate their emissions controls during tests. Somebody actually programmed that. I would be fascinated to know. So is the programmer actually did that? Did they refuse? Did they think it was immoral? Or did they just do what the employer told them? I don't know. But looking sort of at the, the uh, origins of ethics, the fact is that, and I'm sure there are more experts, there are definitely sociologists and there are more experts than me at this, but some people talk about the origins being uh, the fact that people can actually get advantage over dis uh, lying and, and, and exhibiting deceptive behaviour. And, and it's something that's actually deeply conditioned into the natural history of humans. The ability to lie better actually could give you an advantage and may actually uh, impact on your survival. So um, I think that's something we have to think about, that, again, that what drives behaviour. But there, are, there, are, there is hope. Uh, uh, certainly some of the top uh, companies in this space have been meeting since 2016 to try and agree ethical standards in AI, but it's a hugely controversial topic, and generally legislation and governments are always way behind what technology is actually doing, so um, it is a concern. But it's not just the ethical and moral con uh, considerations, there are human rights considerations. So we capture so much data about ourselves, and I'm sure you've heard recently in the news about some of the states in the, in the US that are refusing to have CCTV, and, and for, for good reason. We do watch each other a lot more than we used to. Sometimes these things are for good, sometimes they're not used for good. But there's a whole bunch of human rights that can be impacted by the use of technology, the use of that data, how we actually gather it, how we process it, and, and, uh, and what we do with it, and, and what that impact, how that impacts on people's lives. You can read those lists faster than, uh, than, than I can talk you through them. But again, we don't even have agreed human rights across the world. There, there are many countries that, you know, would not agree with some of those things, and indeed uh, do, do, may put people in, in prison and don't give people proper access to justice, etc. So we have challenges. The EU did pass some new data protection laws a little while back, um, and I, I was interested in that it provided an individual with the right to contest the decision made by automated processing in cases where the individual's legitimate interests and freedoms have been significantly affected. I don't know how that impacts on education, and I certainly defer to some of the lawyers in the room. I'd be interested to hear your perspective. But, you know, if we start to have AI grading of assignments or assessments, might people be arguing, well, you know, my legitimate interest has been that you've damaged my degree and my, my, my lifelong career and I want a human being to mark it. Who knows? Um, we have to see. One of the biggest issues I do think in artificial intelligence is that of bias in data sets. If you train an AI on a data set that has got human decisions on it, or any, it will have bias. You might think you're an independent human being, but we all have biases. There's nothing you can do about it. Life has shaped us. You can be aware of them. You can try and address them. But you have bias. And if you train it, an AI, on, on those bias data sets, not only will they exhibit the same behavior, but they tend to amplify them. And that's an example of LinkedIn, which started showing higher paid jobs to men more than women, simply because the evidence that it had said more men had higher paying jobs. Um, it wasn't deliberate, it was accidental. Uh, Microsoft and Bing, again, some of you may recall, put out, uh, only for a very short space of time, uh, a, a little sort of, I guess, chatbot called Tay, who was designed to talk to American 18 to 24-year-olds to engage, entertain, and actually this was a bot that was kind of learning from the conversations it was having. They had to take it down. Within 24 hours, it became racist. Uh, it started hitting on people. Um, quite what that said about the, the, the human population it was talking to, I won't even go there, but it was interesting what it, what it learned and how it behaved and the lessons that we got from that. So whether bias in data sets is accidental or, or deliberate, we are in a constant game of cat and mouse um, with security, with fraud, with every technology that we use, not just uh, AI. And we need to think about how to address that. 
And a lot of the problems, if you talk to, I'm sure, to our, our cybersecurity colleagues, they will say the computer's locked up, but actually it's the human behavior that's wrong. Quite what this person thought they were doing, I don't know. But as humans, we do do some very bizarre things. Um, we're also quite a trusting bunch. Uh, this could not have ended well. Um, you can see that, you know, the last person is starting to wake up to the fact this threat might be going to land on them. Uh, the others are completely trusting, but on that, I would say probably only the first person is assured of survival. I don't know what happened. But generally, we do tend to trust each other. And sadly, I think uh, that's, that, that's having to change. We're having to think a lot more about uh, how, what we do and what we engage with and whether we are engaging in any sort of uh, person with suspicious behavior. So there's a lot of research around how to try and detect bias. In, in AI, how to make AI explain what it's doing, be responsible, transparent, auditable, incorruptible, unpredictable, all things. It's very, very hard to do because the way we train AI uh, is, is, is not the way that we think. So artificial intelligence cannot say the answer is X because in the same way that we understand it as human beings, and that's quite a, quite a problem. So AI can be incredibly vulnerable. We do have, as I said before, many examples where AI can already outperform humans. So my apologies to the lawyers. Here's an example of, of where AI scored 94% over 20 human lawyers that got an average of 85%. But the key thing is that actually AI is trained on a bunch of data. And if stuff falls out of its remit, um, it can really not know what, what it's doing. So here's, a, here's an example. It's very vulnerable to what we call adversarial attacks. So to you and me, I'm sure to you and me, they both look like pandas. Does anyone want to dispute those pandas? You can't, probably can't tell the difference. But to an AI that's trained on the image of the panda, if you put that noise in, and it's, we still see a panda, it thinks it's a given. Not only does it think it's a given, but it has a 99.3 confidence level that it's a given. So you can see how AI could be broken down at the edges of its knowledge with just uh, a, a, a few of those adversarial um, examples input into a training set. The one that scares me most is this example of a stop sign. So you train AI for uh, you know, uh, self-driving cars, and you train it on stop signs. But you probably don't train it on stop signs that have patches on. And so somebody went and put patches on, and suddenly the self-driving car could not recognize that as a stop sign. But of course, to a human, of course we can still read it's a stop sign. It doesn't matter that it's got a few patches on. So it is of concern, certainly at the edges of the knowledge of AI. So what next for education? Who needs educating? Well, my answer is absolutely everybody. The public, staff, students, pupils, teachers, everybody needs to understand the impact of what's happening in AI in society as well as in the education environment. But looking at our students, the US Department of Labor estimates, and this was some years ago, that, the, that today's learners will have 10 to 14 jobs by the age of 38. That seems a bit soon to me. I can see it happening in the future, but I don't think we're there yet. There are a lot of predictions around job automation. This is just one of them. I think it was from Deloitte. 35 to 49% of jobs or parts of jobs over the next 20, 10 to 20 years will be lost. In the world, we are starting to get a divergence between rich and poor. Those that can reinvent themselves, those that can relearn. 1.4 billion workers in 2018 were in vulnerable jobs. Of course, they weren't all in vulnerable jobs due to technology, but they were in vulnerable jobs, and a large part of those will be due to technology. Uh, the good news is that, in general, to date, technology has created more jobs than it's lost, but that is predicted to change, and it has already seen the slowdown as things become automated and stay automated. There are obviously, you create different jobs for a while, but eventually, jobs may well be um, completely automated. And there's a lot of dispute over that. Uh, whether all jobs could eventually be automated. I've seen predictions between about 30 years and 130 years. Um, if that's true, we, 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 we passed Stephen Hawking's death at 100 years. But it's, it's a serious factor, which is why some of the, the governments, including our own, have been looking at the concept of universal credit, because if people don't have a job, the economy still needs to go around. You still need people to uh, buy goods. So I think in the future, there's going to be a lot of upskilling and reskilling um, of of students. So any students in the audience, 
be aware that you're kidnapped for life. We're going to try and educate you for life, not just for your degree here, that you're here for the moment. And I hope you will enjoy that experience with us. So going forward, um, what do education institutions need to do? Well, there's a lot of talk about bite-sized or nano-sized or micro-credentials. Uh, th these are much smaller well, nano degrees, much smaller components of learning than a traditional degree. So they might essentially be the size of a module, but they could be any size that you choose. But the focus is very much on mass personalised, perhaps just in time education, probably online, directly into the workplace where you need it. There's a lot of discussion about employers pick and mix. So employer says, if you want to come and work for me, then actually, I want one of those units, one of those units, one of those units packaged into some qualification and people, students will then go and study that. Why hasn't it changed? Well, I think one of the issues is the funding models. Everything seems to be year long at the moment, not, uh, not credit based. But the moment it goes credit based, I think a lot of things are up for grabs. So we do need to help our students do lifelong learning, continuing uh, their education. I think learning analytics is a huge one at the moment. It's kind of exploding. Most institutions gather minimal data on their students, but uh, that is set to change. As you talked about, lots of different data sets that we will have on how people learn. And I think we can learn a lot more from how people do learn. You've seen the AI chatbots. I think that's very much current. That's something that we have to do. One of the things briefly is about authentication as you learn. I think at universities and most education systems at the moment are very much focused on uh, a, an administrative convenience, which is we will set one exam paper per year and this is the time you'll sit it. And if you're not ready for it, never mind, we're going to fail you and maybe you fall out of education and so what. If we actually get to the point where we can actually monitor that learning and authenticate that learning as it's happening, you have to ask yourself the question, why do we need to even set assessment at all? Why are we not just you know, signing that learning off as it happens? And I think that's something that may happen more in future. Of course, then we have the future of the AI tutor, quite what that balance will be. At the moment, the predictions are as the starting point that it's actually going to help staff. Whether it ever replaces people, there's an awful long way to go before that. But even looking at that example from Georgia Tech, they have to consider, do they need 15 tutors? If the AI can just do so much of it, maybe they need one human tutor and AI can do the rest already. That's come into their thinking. And of course, there's the downloading. Whether we ever get that will be a long way forward. OK, so my final comment is uh, really from the futurist uh, Kevin Kelly, who says, this is not a race against the machines. If we race against them, we will lose, which I think is what partly Stephen Hawkins was trying to make the point about. Uh, this is a race with the machines. You will be paid in future uh, based on how well you work with robots. 90% of your co-workers will be unseen machines. Whether that will be the case, I don't know, but I think it's certainly a plausible scenario in my head. So what do we need to do as educators? Well, AI can help us in an awful lot of those spaces, a lot of the education that we're doing. But I think it's important we don't just think about artificial intelligence in AI in our education, but we think about how we educate our students for the workforce of the future and what it means for them going forward in their careers. Thank you very much. <laughs>